chapter 12 of the Fundamentals of the Esoteric Philosophy. And uh, the opening pages or paragraphs deal to a very large extent with certain passages from the secret doctrine. <coughs> as a matter of fact, the fundamentals as a work might well be considered a commentary on some of the passages and some of the teachings of the secret doctrine, except that uh, the word commentary does not cover in its entirety the message of the book, because the book contains at the same time an elucidation and further installments of some of the teachings contained in the secret doctrine. But in this particular chapter, <clears throat> we deal more or less with a commentary on three or four propositions found in one of the most important chapters of, first, of the first volume of the secret doctrine wherein HPB says, among other things, that the secret doctrine is the accumulated wisdom of the ages. The fundamental law in that system, the central point from which all emerged, around and toward which all gravitates, and upon which is hung the philosophy of the rest, is the one homogeneous divine substance principle the one radical cause which at once establishes for the student the fact that the conception of the deity in the mind of a theosophist is entirely impersonal. It involves none of the limitations of the human lower mind. It involves none of the emotional attitude of people which exists in so many places and in so many schools with regard to the conception of the divine. The Theosophist's divinity is the central point in the abstract from which everything emerged, which is the center around which everything gravitates, a center into which everything ultimately returns only to reissue again. It is a center that is homogeneous. It is an idea which involves at the same time the conception of substance and the conception of principle, the ideas of matter and consciousness, in other words, of substance and energy. HPV says that the universe is the periodical manifestation of this unknown absolute essence, which of course does not mean uh, that she uses the word universe uh, in the sense of the totality of all that is. It is obvious that the totality is incomprehensible to any human mind and uh, is not subject to periodical manifestations. She means by universe any one universe out of millions, any one particular hierarchy, let us say a solar system, or if that isn't uh, vast enough to satisfy us, then a million solar systems, which we will call a galaxy or island universe, to use the astronomical terms, any one particular aggregate of evolving systems. Such an aggregate has always a beginning, an evolutionary unfoldment, and an end, a relative ending. 
it has its periodical manifestations, it has manifested before, just like a man, it will manifest again, just like we will have another embodiment on this earth. So the universe, in the sense of any one particular system, however gra grand and great it may be, is the periodical manifestation of this unknown absolute essence. And uh, in another place, uh, she says that uh, the field of consciousness, the field of the all, uh, has a constant succession of manifesting universes like sparks of eternity <laughs> and there are always some universes that come up others that are in full bloom at this particular time and some others which go out or are just about to go out so in the endless fields of infinity and eternity uh, we can observe uh, even on the physical plane, let alone on the inner planes of consciousness, the appearance and the disappearance of individual universes like tides that come and go, like the ebb and the flow of the tides in the sea. She also speaks of the fact that the universe is called, with everything in it, Maya, because all is temporary therein, from the ephemeral life of a firefly to that of the sun. <coughs> and as a matter of fact, what difference is there in conception between the life span of the firefly <coughs> and the life span of a sun? from the standpoint of our small human conceptions. Naturally, the firefly is something very small and puny and insignificant, and the sun is something tremendous and majestic and uh, almost uh, forever enduring when looked from our standpoint. But in essence, the life of the sun is just as ephemeral as the life of a firefly compared with something still greater beyond our conception which, uh, in which all of what we know is included as a mere atom. And at the same time the lifespan of a firefly is certainly, even from the standpoint of our modern science, a period very long indeed as compared with the cycles pertaining to the life span of an atom or of an electron. How relative are these various conceptions? And now we have a uh, fairly long quote here from the same a part of the secret doctrine around page 272, 73, and 74 in the first volume, a passage which contains a wealth of basic propositions of the esoteric philosophy. It's packed with teachings, packed with meaning. HPV says the universe is worked and guided from within outward. As above, so it is below, as in heaven, so on earth, and man, the microcosm and miniature copy of the macrocosm, is the living witness to this universal law and to the mode of its action. We see that every external motion, act, gesture, whether voluntary or mechanical, organic or mental, is produced and preceded by internal feeling or emotion, will or volition, and thought or mind. As no outward motion or change, when normal, in man's external body can take place unless provoked by an inward impulse, 
given through one of the three functions named, so with the external or manifested universe. The whole cosmos is guided, controlled, and animated by almost endless series of hierarchies of sentient beings, each having a mission to perform, and who, whether we give to them one name or another, and call them Dian Chohans or angels, are messengers in the sense only that they are the agents of karmic and cosmic law. Now the main thing here is to bear in mind that everything in the universe is worked and guided from within outwards, that is in the process of evolutionar, evolutional unfoldment. Everything that we see has its uh, roots, its impelling urges, within its own constitution. Everything that we can observe in the world of manifestation is uh, organized from within, uh, is a uh, embodiment of an internal energy in manifestation. Everything that we are ourselves and everything that we observe outside of ourselves is only a relatively uh, expressed, partially expressed manifestation of something higher. In a way, we might even speak of it as being a symbol, merely a temporary symbol of something far greater than the symbol itself. And so, whether we consider our own lives or the life of an atom or the life story of a universe, we see that the whole of the cosmos, as HPB says, is guided, controlled, and animated by almost endless series of hierarchies of sentient beings and that these beings on whatever level or plane or scale they may be might be looked upon in the mystical sense of the old Greeks the mystical sense of the early Christians who call the spiritual motivating powers of the inner universe, angeloi, which means messengers, not what the word angel has come to mean in later theology, but in the original sense of being messengers of a higher force, transmitters <coughs> of a higher power, distributors of a certain message, the carriers of a uh, uh, force, of a power, of a pattern or blueprint, uh, which eventually, uh, when embodied in the lower worlds, gives manifestation to the powers within. And that all of them are messengers only in the sense of being agents of karmic and cosmic laws. Then she continues by saying, they vary infinitely in their respective degrees of consciousness and intelligence. And to call them all pure spirits without any of the earthly alloy which time is wont to prey upon is only to indulge in poetical fancy, for each of these beings either was or prepares to become a man, if not in the present, then in a past or a coming cycle, or manvantara. They are perfected when not incipient men, and differ morally from the terrestrial human beings on their higher, less material spheres, 
only in that they are devoid of the feeling of personality and of the human emotional nature, two purely earthly characteristics. Now this involves an exceedingly important point of teaching, point of the esoteric philosophy, uh, which we should carefully consider and try to remember. Because this teaching, when misunderstood, taken out of its general context and uh, twisted, uh, not uh, on account of predetermined evil will, but twisted because of ignorance and misunderstanding, uh, has given rise and probably will continue to give rise to false teachings, which unfortunately exist in some portions of the organized theosophical movement. Uh, the important point, I mean, is to remember that the esoteric philosophy teaches in this connection that when we look from where we are as human beings upon the various hierarchies, low and high, the various grades of evolving beings below us and above us, we can say, and this is just a paraphrase of what HPB says here, we can say that below us as human beings are myriads of entities who in due course of time will become men. They are incipient men, potential men. In the future they will evolve <coughs> into becoming human beings. And the myriad of entities above us are men who have graduated from the human school of life. <clears throat> they used to be men, mere men, then became perfected men, then finally entered into higher schools of learning way above our condition of manhood. They are spiritual beings. So they are uh, past men, perfected men and beyond, and in the other direction they are incipient potential men. So that this stream of evolutionary <coughs> growth rising from the depth of the lower degrees we might say passes through the stage of manhood at one or another time and forges ahead into greater realms of spirit. This is important to remember because uh, there exist today in certain portions of the theosophical movement and in certain books that pass for theosophical, uh, quite a lot of teachings uh, which uh, propound the idea uh, that there are other kingdoms of life in the universe, uh, the kingdom of the angels, or maybe of the devas, to use the Sanskrit word for, for the same thing, which run in their evolution parallel with the human race uh, without ever meeting our stream at all. This, unfortunately, is a lot of wishful thinking. It is a mix-up, a cross-breed between some particle of truth and uh, exoteric legends mostly of the Hindu cycle of legends and religious folklore. It is not the teaching of the esoteric philosophy. It is not supported by anything that you can find in the secret doctrine 
or the other original installments of the esoteric philosophy from very high sources, and it cannot be shown to hang together with all the other teachings. And the beauty of the esoteric philosophy is that every teaching in it hangs harmoniously and blends perfectly with all the other portions of the same system of thought. Anything that does not blend, that clashes, that produces impossible gaps, must be shown and can be shown to be an alteration of the original teachings based either on ignorance or on wishful thinking or on a misunderstanding of one kind or another for which, of course, we uh, uh, do not blame anyone. We simply point out to the fact that, like everything else in life, there are genuine teachings and there are perverted teachings, but we do not mean by saying this that there is any evil motive in so doing. Uh, the great uh, schools of evolutionary unfoldment, uh, which we might call kingdoms of life, they blend with each other, they pass one into another. Uh, there is a uh, endless line without possible beginning or end without ultimate beginning or ultimate <coughs> end, I mean, a pilgrimage of evolutionary unfoldment, a golden thread upon which all the myriad forms of life are strung, so that each kingdom is helped by the one above it. Each kingdom is, uh, we might say, even pushed forward by the one behind it in a certain peculiar mystical way. There is a relation both ways there. And uh, it is precisely because there is that endless progression, because all the kingdoms of life hang together and are interrelated, it is for that simple reason that the esoteric philosophy is full of endless hope because for every stage of life uh, there is forever hope of becoming something greater. If all of this were divided into parallel lines which do not meet and ever cross, the whole uh, beautiful symmetry of the system would fall apart. So HPB continues, the differentiation of the germ of the universe into the septenary hierarchy of conscious divine powers who are the active manifestations of the one supreme energy. They are the framers, shapers, and ultimately the creators of all the manifested universe in the only sense in which the name creator is intelligible. They inform and guide it. They are the intelligent beings who are just and control evolution, embodying in themselves those manifestations of the one law which we know as the laws of nature. Here again the thought is clearly brought out that uh, throughout the structure of the universe, there runs a uniform pattern, an overall blueprint, which the various hierarchies of beings follow. It isn't an outline that has been drawn by any kind of a cosmic personal divinity. We might say that the outline itself, the pattern, the law upon which it operates, is a fact of being. It would be impossible for our finite minds to give, it in, to give it any kind of a definition. 
We may observe its workings, but we cannot define its essential nature as it transcends and will forever transcend the limits of our finite mentality. And with regard to the word, word creator, which has been so awfully misunderstood by uh, organized medieval theologies, it should be borne in mind that all it means to the theosophist, if he uses it at all, is that a certain creative power within the man or within the universal system brings forth into manifestation an already existing spiritual reality. It is not the bringing of something out of nothing, the making, the fashioning of something out of nothing. In that sense, of course, every human being is a creator. He cannot do anything, not even write a letter, without being a creator in the sense of manifesting upon a piece of paper a sequence of thoughts. In that sense, he is a creator. But he has not brought upon the piece of paper something out of nothing. Now, with these ideas before us all, I guess there will be some questions or comments up to this particular point in our study. <coughs> Boris, yes. I don't understand quite well why did you say that idea of the angels having a different kind of evolution parallel but apart from humanity could be a wishful thinking because in reality I would consider that something that would pertain to injustice. I don't know why is the word wishful thinking applied there? Well, I use that word <coughs> with a uh, certain <coughs> thought in the back of my mind regarding some people <coughs> who forever love the idea of worshipping, adoring something that is outside of themselves and does not in any way pertain to themselves. Uh, the exoteric religions of the world have all done that. And some people who have studied theosophy but did not understand its teachings have done, unfortunately, the same. Is they seem to be in the heart and the mind of some of us uh, humans a peculiar desire to imagine that there are entities in the universe which can be worshipped, which we can lean upon, which we can invoke for help without having any particular relation to them. Uh, that is wishful thinking, while if we realize sufficiently clearly that these entities whom we certainly uh, must revere without worshipping, that these entities once upon a time were men, and that we men today once upon a time in the future will be like they are today and greater. It cuts at the root of all personal worship, then we feel that uh, what you have mentioned yourself, justice, cosmic justice, is uh, a thread running through the entire cosmic structure, and that there are no gaps between the kingdoms of life, and that we are all 
uh, weighed, we might say, in the same cosmic scale. See what I mean? Any other ideas or comments? Then, in other words, we shouldn't expect them to help us to attain that and sort of make them a crutch, but try to bring that which they have out in ourselves. That's it. Because each one of us potentially has within <coughs> ourselves those centers of power which have made those higher beings what they are today. Well, what did she mean? And there she goes on about them having been men, but then she says, or or they will be men and wait for another Manvantara to become men. Uh, she means the kingdoms below us. In other words, the elementals, oh. the minerals, the vegetables, and most of the animal kingdom. In due course of time, the monads, evolving through these kingdom, kingdoms, will become human will have reached the stage of human self-consciousness, but it will not be in this particular manvantara. So we can call them, as she calls them, incipient men, potential men, the manhood or the humanhood of future cycles. <coughs> While all those above us are perfected men, and individuals who have gone even far beyond that stage, but were, were human beings once upon a time in the distant past. Now you are entirely right on that point. Just as you said, we should not lean upon them. Our attitude towards these greater beings should be one of reverence. By reverencing them, we do uh, nothing else really but reverencing the spiritual part of ourselves because we too inwardly have the nucleus of a Mahatman and we have the nucleus of a demigod and we have a center of consciousness which eventually will blossom forth into full-fledged godhood. We have those centers. If we didn't, we would never be able to become or to reach those stages of evolution. The seeds of, the, of those future attainments are with us today. Analogically, the seeds of humanhood are in the animal, are in the vegetable, are in the mineral, or the elemental. The seeds of the higher kingdoms, that is the seeds of that type of consciousness, is in them. If it weren't so, they would never become anything higher. But there is a great difference between reverence, recognition of greatness, the desire to emulate, to become and to grow like unto them <coughs> by intuition and an urge to grow. There's a great difference between that on the one hand and a worshipful attitude, an adoring attitude and prayer for uh, favors and advantages which we have not earned ourselves. <clears throat> it makes you sort of sick inside because um, you know how many religions teach that and nothing else. Yes, most of them. That is why the dear people, the very lovely people that many of <laughs> these schools contain are living in a fool's paradise. They are living in a delusion, in a world of unreality for which we cannot blame them. Many of them live beautiful lives and are constructive elements 
in the life of the community in spite of the religious school to which they belong. Because frankly, I don't see the slightest incentive on the part of any man or woman to try and live a decent life or to grow or to become better if you can put, or if you are told, to put all your sins on the shoulders of Jesus or the Virgin Mary or the corresponding Mohammedan and Hinduist uh, gods and let it all be there. Well, what's the use of doing anything better? So I think the fact that millions of people are trying to better themselves is something that they are doing in spite of the very pernicious, dangerous, and Ill delusive doctrines which they have been taught from childhood. That, to me, stands as a proof of the existence of the inner man in every human being. That in spite of wrong teaching, they have an urge from within to do something to better their life. I don't think I could make my question at all clear, so I will buy it. Oh, yeah. try. <laughs> Whenever uh, the discussion of evolution like this comes up, mm -hmm. uh, the thought always sort of flits across my mind. Man is always used as a, not a midway point exactly, but it's, uh, we think of things up to man and then things from man onward. Yeah. Uh, if you were a midway point, it would refute the whole theory of eternal evolution. Yeah. Uh, is it because at that is it because at that point the uh, entity becomes self-conscious? Is that why it's used as a um, as a midpoint? As a, it's sort of a midpoint. I can't as a uh, direct you know. No, a I wouldn't say so, Audrey. No, I would rather say that it is a midpoint or used as a midpoint simply because we are human and uh, the human teachers talk to us or write for us. Wherever you are, in whatever kingdom you may be, you are really in the middle of infinity. <laughs> in both directions there is infinity. Infinity is indefinable and you are in the paradoxical middle of it. Uh, there are stretches into illimitable distances of time and consciousness in both directions. So I suppose if we could imagine such an impossible thing as uh, these teachings being studied uh, by an animal or a vegetable or studied by a god who knows them anyway, he probably would speak of it from the standpoint of that particular state of consciousness and would imagine himself to be in the middle of a procession with infinity in both directions. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't think there is any other reason because obviously the human state of consciousness, self-consciousness, is by no means uh, the most important state of consciousness in a hierarchy. No, it's the lowest uh, state, though, where self-consciousness is attained. Yes. So, um, of course, I could add a few words from another angle, and that is that there is a relative importance in it, only a relative importance, in that all conditions of consciousness or states below the human are not self-conscious. Uh, they are consciousness conditions which do not reflect upon themselves. They do not mirror themselves, do not recognize themselves consciously and have not yet unfolded the power of the freedom of choice. So the human consciousness is the middle point also in that sense, that it is the bridge 
between non-self consciousness and a condition of consciousness above the human. And it embodies the rudiments, the beginnings of the freedom of choice which develops through the various stages of humanhood into a full-fledged freedom of choice among perfected men, the teachers, the masters, the adepts. When you jump into the next hierarchy above, well, self-consciousness is not of the human kind. It is self-consciousness of demigods, which I really couldn't even try to define. And uh, you enter into <coughs> kingdoms which are devoid of human personality and human type of emotions. That is also something we don't have words to define. Well, I was, um, if you think about man as being seven principles, yeah. and then these seven uh, kingdoms, yes. that's fine. I mean, then, then that, the, the, man, the human point is the midway point. Yeah. If you think of man as having 12 principles, it throws it all off, and I've never been able to reconcile style with 12 with the seven kingdoms they don't seem to be compatible you know i mean if you uh, yeah. as soon as you get into the 12 principles of man rather than seven well then you you don't have a a comparison yeah and i always thought maybe i didn't know if it was if it were if it were if it were even an analogy or not and it's, it's always flitted through my mind but it seems sort of an elementary question and yet it worries me it disturbs me when i think about it at seven and twelve the analogy exists. As a matter of fact, the analogy is perfect. I don't know how well whether I can make it um, consistently clear. You see, as long as you talk about seven principles, ten kingdoms of life or ten classes of monads, and maybe some other sevenfold division, and you might bring in the 12 signs of the zodiac, it all sounds like pretty much of a confusion because you are comparing things which should not be compared. You deal with different systems of numeration which should not be done. If we speak of the manifested universe of that portion of a universal hierarchy which is fully manifested we should confine ourselves to a sevenfold division if we speak of the entire hierarchy some of which is unmanifested some of it uh, forms the link between the unmanifested part and the manifested one and some of which is fully manifested. Then we'll have to bring in the 12 principal elements of any entity, the 12 classes of monads or 10 classes with two links that bind them to other hierarchies the 12 signs of the zodiac and keep to this 12-fold division. Then it all hangs together. But then also we mustn't talk about seven globes of a chain. We'll have to talk about the 12 globes. <laughs> now the reason why HPB in the Secret Doctrine has outlined her teachings on the basis of a seven-fold division is because she felt, and probably her teachers did at the time, that that will be just about as much as any student of the latter part of the 19th century could possibly understand or follow. She even hinted at the fact that when it comes to the unmanifested part of a hierarchy, the teachings are too abstruse to touch upon. 
so she most certainly did not elucidate anything about uh, the higher principal elements above the seven or the higher globes above the seven and only inferentially here and there spoke of uh, uh, the twelve gods of the ancients and things like that by hints and allusions showing that there is a twelve-fold division. But many of these teachings since her days have been not only explained but elaborated upon and further installments from the same source of information has been given through the writings and the work of Dr. de Peruca. Now, some students of theosophy, some of our own brother students throughout the world, will not agree with what I've said now. They will question and show considerable suspicion that any man could have, since HPB's days, brought in any further installment from the same source of occult information. The reason being that good students as they are, they have crystallized their minds into a mold. That mold says HPB is the last word. Nobody until another messenger turns up in the latter part of the 20th century can ever turn up or show us anything more than what HPB left in the secret doctrine. That's a lot of eyewash. With all the great reverence that we have for HPB as a teacher and considering the fact that the secret doctrine will stand as a profound source of occult information for centuries to come, we must never forget the fact that HPB herself in a secret doctrine says that century the 20th might see the appearance of another man who will give irrefutable proof of the existence of this, that, and the other. Now, here we stand, of course, on the ground which um, allows uh, of a wide difference of views and I'm not pushing my feeling in the matter upon any one of you. But as far as I'm concerned, that individual has already turned up. To me, it was Dr. de Peruca. His work was the next installment of the teachings and uh, it would take a lot of sweat and blood on the part of some of my brother theosophists to prove that I'm wrong, though I'm not forcing that idea upon any one of them. You see? I don't know how we started this sort of uh, by path here, but anyway, this is in answer to what uh, has been asked. Now to go back for a moment to your question there, has that been mm -hmm. fairly clearly set forth? We must not mix up numerations. Um, it would take a long time and probably a blackboard and perhaps even a whole booklet of material to make plain if any one of us can make it plain, how the 12 principal elements and the 12 globes of the chain and the 10 classes of monads with the two links on each side, how they are related. Personally, I do not have the uh, full knowledge of such things wouldn't even think of claiming to have that knowledge, although we know many individual points. And as far as our knowledge goes, 
it can be stated that there is a perfect coordination and concordance between the rounds, the races, the globes, the classes of monads, the principles and the elements of which all of this is built, including ourselves, so that the framework, or rather the blueprint of the planetary chain, or even of the solar system, is so beautifully engineered by those cosmic spiritual engineers that the general pattern reflects itself on all the scales throughout, even to the remarkable point that the, uh, the numerals, the digits of various cosmic cycles can be shown to be present in the beating of a human heart. This just is an illustration. But that is a very vast subject. Am I the only one who wants to ask another question? Go ahead, honey. <laughs> I will this is going to be immortalized, you see, through yeah. this uh, gadget. This might go as far as Holland before you know. Oh, Your voice will be traveling from lodge to lodge over there. Um, you frightened me now. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. You're talking about the manifested principles of men. Yeah. As the five, as against the five unmanifested. Uh, to me, the, the Atman is unmanifested. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I. I never can, when they start dividing it there, I can't see how the Atman can possibly be considered a manifested principle in man. Yes. Even the booty, even the higher mental body seems yes. so remote. And from our human standpoint, I think that you are right. I think that uh, many of the Hindu schools of esoteric thought, the well-known Hindu schools of philosophy like the Sankhya and the Yoga and the Vedanta uh, will agree uh, with your idea that the Atman is hardly an individualized principle. It can hardly be spoken of as being manifested. So there you have already a portion of the higher a uh, spiritual constitution of an entity which is more or less a bridge between the manifested and the wholly unmanifested part of it. Now, we do not have even names or terms for the unmanifested part of the human constitution. All that uh, has ever been said on that subject is simply to to draw a triangle or perhaps a five-pointed star above the seven principles indicating that there are five higher which in some mysterious way are related to the unmanifested principles of the universe of which we are a part. Let us say the, uh, the planetary chain. And in the case of the planetary chain, the same correspondence to the solar system. So you are right in your feeling there. The Atman is the, is the divinity in man, a ray of cosmic divinity, and uh, everything that is above it is completely unknown to us, except that by analogy, and correspondences, we feel that there exists, or that there exist in man, these higher links for him to be linked with the corresponding realities 
of the universe. <clears throat> In this connection, attention might be drawn to certain passages in the Mahatma letters. I cannot give you the pages right off the bat, but it's there, and we can find them. Wherein the general idea is brought out in guarded language that even the greatest of spiritual seers and adepts knows of the system in which he lives and evolves but the vegetative side of it and has no knowledge, none, of the real spiritual portions or principal elements of the system. The analogy exists in the human being. The vegetative side of the human being is everything that is below the personal mind and we might include in it the personal mind itself. The vegetative personal side, including the physical, astral, vital structure, the psychological nature, the emotional, psychological apparatus, and a certain amount of the mind, not the higher mind, but the lower brain mentality. It is apparently just that vegetative, physical, and psychological and lower mental part of the cosmic system that the highest seers have cognizance of. And to them, the higher spiritual principles of the system as, as unknown, relatively speaking, as to the average human being are unknown, the manas, buddhi, atman of his own constitution. Do you see what I mean? Including the Dianjo Apparently. Apparently including the gods of the solar system. So supernally infinite and grand are those realities. Now, of course, I don't know whether the Master meant the gods of the sun or anything like that. They may have that cognizance. But he spoke of the highest seers of, the, of this planet and perhaps of the inner world of that planet. We can find that passage. Um, it has remained rather obscure and uh, incomprehensible for many years. I would say that not until the appearance of some of the works of Dr. de Peruca has that passage acquired a meaning. And obviously so, because the Master talked to Sinet, and Sinet was a beginner at the time. So just hints were given on these profound subjects. It is hardly even touched in the secret doctrine, or just hints and allusions on that. But the most outspoken passages in the Mahatma letters, if you, can, if you have the key to it. Otherwise, it really doesn't mean too much. If you look at it superficially, we, we can find the actual passage. Yeah? Um, going back to the other way, mm -hmm. Taken our position back to the elemental yep. and into the other previous world chain. Yes. Uh, is there anything on that? What what existed there? In what other direction? Just as far as what Harvey is talking about in the future direction. Uh huh. That is in the direction of the elemental kingdom. 
before that even. Yeah. Well, of course, the moment you strike the elemental kingdoms, and there are three main kingdoms of the elements, you reach the bottommost level, we might say, in this particular hierarchy. Uh, beyond them there would be some link I couldn't tell you what but some type of link whereby this hierarchy is connected with the one below it there is always something above and there is always something below the higher realms connect by some super spiritual link to some greater hierarchy beyond it. Connect, of course, to the lowest rung of that next ladder. By analogy, below the elementals is a link or links which will connect that hierarchy, our hierarchy, with the higher reaches, the highest reaches, of the hierarchy immediately below. Uh, I couldn't tell you what it is. Uh, I don't think that I could point out to any passage in our literature that would describe what it is. Beyond the general statement that there is a linkage of individual and contiguous hierarchies, one below the other or one above the other, and of course links sidewise with hierarchical systems which are on the same level with us. Everything is interlocked. That would apply also to the planetary chains, to the various planets of the solar system. In the solar system there would be planets belonging to various levels or hierarchical structures of life. As a matter of fact, the whole idea there, the one that you bring out and the others, simply reinforces our uh, uh, growing, budding understanding that there is infinity in all directions. It isn't anything that you can draw on a blackboard, or can you express it <coughs> in ordinary language. You might perhaps find in the minds of a great um, mathematician, some, uh, some uh, symbols, uh, some uh, sequence of symbols with which such ideas can be expressed. Mathematics are very symbolical. If interpreted along occult lines, some of the known formula might indicate or hint at some of these teachings, interestingly enough. But we could approach that subject of interlocking hierarchies and links between them if we picture to ourselves just one thing, if nothing else. If we picture to ourselves the hierarchy that is our own, here and now, the human being, with his stula sharir and his linga sharir and his prana and the karma and the manas and the buddhi and the atman, his own individual hierarchical element principles. If we pick any one of them, any one of these seven, we could draw a line through it and picture to ourselves that it again 
is a hierarchy in itself. Each one of these principles has its own stula sharira, linga sharira, prana, karma, manas, buddhi and atman, each one of these. If we picture the man as an upright, the others would be transverse. The more you think of these things, the more you realize the endless interlocking of universal hierarchies. Did you listen to last week? It was dark to see that and ask a question. How does that work? Wait a minute, a little. Hmm? It's going. It's going now. Well, we still have a little time left. Anybody would like to bring up something? I think as far as our chapter 12 is concerned, it would be just about enough for tonight because this is very, very meaty. I have an idea that we will be on that chapter for another two meetings. I've read it carefully today. I thought we might proceed a little further than we have, but uh, the meeting has been quite, uh, quite serious and rather profound. There is no, uh, no, no use of overloading our minds. So considering what that chapter contains from now on, we'll take quite a little slice of it next time, and I think that we will have plenty for one more meeting. Uh, as I read it, I found that practically uh, in every paragraph there were key thoughts which should not be just slurred over or only lightly touched upon. So we'll just keep on the same chapter now. Anything else? How about you, Jane? We'll wait till you change the subject a little bit and then make a hundred questions. That's all right. We can just branch out to something else now. Yeah. Well, I don't want to be the first one to branch out. Oh, go ahead. We, we, we really covered mm -hmm. quite a bit on that, so we might as well uh, get another line now. You have something that you would like to have elucidated a little? Well, let me form it. Yes, that's all right, sure. Anyone else? How about the little that? Um, Was it difficult to follow? No, you not You could follow this, could you? Sometimes it go away for a little while. Uh -huh. But it uh, it sounded uh, sounded all right to you. Oh, yes. It was understandable. It is. That's very nice. <coughs> I don't want to waste it then. Extrapolate. another hour here. Extrapolate to the mirror. We have another hour there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I might as well say this. It might as well be on the, on the record there that I had thought if such uh, records uh, are practical and can actually be made and sound all right, they might be of some use in, um, in other parts of the world, and I have particularly in mind Holland. They have such wonderful students, they have a lot of young people, and uh, I think they would be interested in knowing a little bit about uh, the way we do our work here. They have their own classes, I couldn't tell you how they conduct them, but they are very successful. Uh, they have uh, people who are exceedingly active. They're all working people. It's amazing what they do. When I get a schedule of meetings from there, it's a it's a infinite number of meetings and groups filling whole pages. Uh, Practically no day passes that there isn't some kind of a meeting in the evening 
at one or another place in town, and that is repeated from one town to the other. And then they have public meetings on top. And then they have conventions. And occasionally they have a, uh, they rent a hall, and they have two, three hundred people, and they have to turn away members so, so as to accommodate inquirers and the general public. Well, many of them understand English, of course. So I thought, I will ask a few of my friends there what kind of machines they have, whether this sort of reel will, uh, uh, will be usable. If they have the same sort of machine, or perhaps we can make some duplications, or just have one duplication, and have them duplicate again whatever they want and uh, they might be very interested for all for all I know to hear different voices different approaches kind of questions that are being asked kind of answers that are given it's worth uh, worth trying they listen to ours and then erase it and put theirs on the same tape I guess they could probably could too yes I would imagine they're going to keep something like this. They probably will want mm -hmm. to keep it. Uh, anything that is uh, in, in line with the spread of the teachings and more mutual interconnection, I mean more friendly ties in knowing what another part of the world is doing and how. All that is uh, useful for our work. Boys, don't you think that being the um, idea of the Swabhava, the rather deep subject, it wouldn't be convenient to have from you a preliminary explanation for the next uh, meeting, to preparing ourselves for detailed understanding on, on what we are going to read? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course we have, we have gone into it to some extent already. Here it comes up again for the whole page or more because his system, his method of teaching is the old method of touching lightly upon a teaching and branching out to something else and in the next chapter coming back to the same teaching saying something more about it expanding your understanding of it. In another chapter, coming at it for a third time, uh, broadening your understanding again. It is the old method of teaching. So, of course, we have already spent some little time on, on Swabhava. We will have to spend a little more time on it. Uh, the um, key thought there is extremely practical. It is just one of those highly metaphysical concepts that can be used for practical purposes any day. And if it couldn't be done, there wouldn't be much use in the metaphysical concept. But the mere fact that every evolving entity can unfold from within itself only that which it is within itself and nothing else. That mere idea, that mere fact is sufficient to base upon a whole uh, concept of ethical teaching and conduct when we realize that we can unfold from within ourselves only that which is within us already we can never unfold that which is in the inner nature of another human being no more so than a acorn will ever bring out a daisy or a strawberry it will invariably bring out an oak yes it can be slightly modified by grafting 
and that's true enough. But then the seeds of the grafting are going to produce trees that will be modified. From then on they will produce their own modified type. But they will never change from oaks to birches or from strawberries to tulips. And a human being and any other entity in any hierarchy is going forever to unfold from within itself only that which is already potentially enfolded in that consciousness. Of course, Boris, I imagine that ultimately we can say that we would be able to to unfold in many, many, many ways because uh, the possibilities of our our inner possibilities are practically infinite. Infinite, certainly. And at the time we could only develop what is uh, present there, but for the future, probably the possibilities are infinite. Yes, that is that is true. And the other aspect of it is the aspect of self becoming. Um, we might almost say that one aspect of the teaching could be expressed by self-becoming with an accent on the word becoming and the other aspect of self-becoming is with the, asp with the accent on the word self. What I mean is self-becoming in the sense that that becoming, that unfolding, is done by ourselves not by someone else. You are becoming by the, uh, by the powers, the urge, the desire to grow and to unfold that is within yourself. You can never become what, what you inwardly are. You can never become greater, nobler, bigger in every way, uh, with a greater degree of inner knowledge by the efforts of another human being. Now, he can help you in many ways, yes, but his own effort is not going to make you grow. No more so than no amount of effort on the part of the mother is going to make the child walk. But a great deal of help an example and kindness and guidance on the part of the mother is going to help the child to learn how to walk. This is not a contradiction but a paradox, but the child is the only one who will ever learn how to walk by his own internal urge to do so. So the self-becoming, the self-unfoldment, is not only the becoming and the unfoldment of the inner self into manifestation, but it is also the becoming and the unfoldment of that self by its own inherent power. And a third aspect there, which is quite abstruse, but can be made into a great practical power in human life, is that whatever unfolds, whatever grows, constantly brings out from within itself its own universe. Very metaphysical point that. I don't know whether I can put it in any simple language. An unfold, an unfolding uh, divinity of a universe unfolds from within itself the universe. The whole of that universe is a manifestation of that divinity. Every fiber, every atom, every electron in that universe 
reflects a portion of the divinity of which it is an unfoldment that is applicable to a man as well. Every one of us sitting in this room now is an unfoldment of the powers that are latent within. Every particle of us, every one to the very last atoms in us, manifest to some degree what we inwardly are. No, por no portion of us belongs to another human being. We are forever evolving within our own sphere. Well, that means a lot, practically, means a lot. The man who lives in this house, this or another house, fills that house with his own atmosphere. You enter into it, you have entered into that man, literally. Because everything radiates what that man is. His art, his genius, his kindness, or his hatred, his revenge, his criminal tendencies, if that is the kind of a man we have, oozes out of everything in the house. He has filled his place, he has built it out of himself. I don't mean now the bricks in the wall, but I mean the subtle forces and fluids and emanations of the world of consciousness which he has built out of himself and in which he dwells. And you see what a tremendous power there is in that teaching whereby we can build a universe of thought such as, as will uh, reflect uh, not only upon our own decency and spiritual nobility, uh, but will bring help and courage and an elevating power in the lives of other people. We can contact others with nothing else but what we are. But what we are is the partial manifestation of what we inwardly have become. And the greater the degree of our unfoldment, the nobler is the universe, our universe, in which we live, our own personal universe in which we live and by means of which we can contact and influence other centers of consciousness evolving side by side with us in their own hierarchical line. Is that, does that make sense? Do I carry my thought across? Well, it, it is correct to say that uh, this Abhava is uh, related to cycles because I can see that uh, that unfolding of uh, the person is within has the limitation of the cycle. Yes. Minor cycles and, and greater cycles and uh, and banter. Yes. Oh. Each in each of the cycles is part of this Abhava that is uh, possible to to manifest unfold. Unfold. Yes, certainly. Oh yes, sure. Uh, the process of self-becoming has its limitations according to the cycles in which the evolving entity happens to be, karmically so. Um, it is simply another way of saying that we cannot do everything that we decide to do irrespective of existing limitations. We may decide to unfold a far greater uh, type of consciousness from within and set our minds at becoming 
great spiritual seers, but there will be a lot of karmic limitations to overcome and many cycles that will militate against us because they are the result of our own making so that the fruition of our excellent purpose and desire will be postponed until many seeds of past karma have had time to work themselves out. <coughs> the only thing that we are at all times completely free to do is to make a resolution, to take a choice, to make a decision, to carry it out. That's an entirely different thing. But to make the resolution and the choice, which is the first step, in that we are free at any time. <coughs> and I imagine that from some standpoint of view, boys, we, uh, the, the human race, are practically, in a certain way, the middle because we are the highest <coughs> of the of the physical manifestation. In other words, for an animal to become a man, it has to go through manvantas. Mm -hmm. While I can imagine that for a man to evolve into a more perfected man, it doesn't need to go through a manvanta because it has reached the highest of the physical manifestation. I see. Yes, that is uh, largely true, <coughs> especially after the uh, rounding out of the, um, uh, the, the lowest point in the evolutionary history of the Earth, the bottommost point which divides uh, the descending arc from the ascending arc. It is interesting to note that um, individuals beyond the human do not necessarily use physical bodies at all. Of course, that applies to the elemental kingdom as well. But it's interesting to note that there are some kingdoms, vegetable, animal, and human, that are so physicalized that their uh, dynamic evolution takes place in physical forms. But the elemental kingdoms do not have any physical forms, though they might take some at times and entities beyond the human kingdom, the kingdoms of the Dhyan Chohans, for instance, are completely devoid of physical form or shape. They're not dependent upon that anymore, showing how, how relative these things are and how temporary they are. The time will come in, in inevitably when every one of us will have a choice to work uh, within a physical body and through it or without. At that time we will be a certain type of adept who has that choice. The time will inevitably come when we will pass beyond that choice, when it will be completely impossible for us to work through a physical body because of its limitations. Well, I understood that in order to make an evolution, at least uh, in the stage we, we are, mm -hmm. it is absolutely necessary to have a physical body. Yes. Yes. And probably that is uh, related to elemental. Probably the way that they acquire even temporary physical bodies, that is the way in which they can have some impulses in the evolution. Yeah. Yes, yes, that is, uh, that is true. Um, and we must also remember that the physical bodies 
of the various kingdoms are not yet fully developed. They will have a further evolutionary perfection in succeeding rounds. Here we have a subject which is apt to be misunderstood. We can speak of various stages in the evolution of the physical body. Physical, the shtula sharira, the physical prakriti as they call them in India, or matter. It has various stages of perfectibility or development. We know today physical vehicles of the fourth round, fifth root race. We know eventually physical bodies of sixth root race and seventh root race of the fourth round. Well, of course, you realize that the physical bodies, the physical part of man, has still the fifth, sixth, and seventh round to evolve in. So, there are much higher stages in the development of even the physical matter. But if I could show you to illustrate what those higher stages are, none of our senses would perceive them because they're utterly invisible to our senses. <coughs> In other words, here's a paradox. If we can speak of a root race of human beings in the fifth round or the sixth, and if we can speak of them as inhabiting physical bodies, we will be telling the truth. These physical bodies will be immensely more perfected than are ours. But when we use the word perfected for that, we must remember that they will be made of such tenuous substance of such a high evolutionary degree that we can call them physical only by courtesy. They will be made of light and magnetic energies, but they will be the fifth or sixth or seventh round development of physical matter. Do you get my idea? Yeah. Yeah. And that is very... It shows you that every concept is relative. Very. The same the physical embodiments of the elementals are much more material than any matter we know here. Because of that, they are completely invisible. Say it again, words with the physical embodiments of the elemental kingdom are at times much more material than, our, than is our matter here. And because they are much more material, they cannot be perceived by our senses, therefore they are invisible. That's a, that's a paradox. We, we center our conceptions around our senses and what they perceive. So it is difficult for us to imagine that this space here and now could be occupied by a type of matter which is very much more dense and material than anything we know. And we could walk through it with the greatest of ease because it bears no vibration relation to our senses. So it doesn't exist. The same thing for another kingdom, another level of consciousness which may exist here and now and have no cognizance 
of the existence of that house at all because it stands in no vibrational relation to it. That, of course, we know, we definitely know that because here is a world of electromagnetic energies with radios and televisions and electromagnetic waves and they fill this room and they fill all the houses in Los Angeles but nobody can see them. They are an interpenetrating world that coexists at exactly the same time in space with all else that we call matter but they are not in our way. We do not bump against them. We do not skin our shins on electromagnetic waves. They exist at the same time, at the same place, and they are non-existent for us unless we have a, some gadget by which we can tune in. And even then we cannot touch. How about you? Anything in your mind? Well, uh, no. The only thing I want to say for it is that there's something I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that is, that if our um, inner feelings, I don't know if I'm going to be able to put this in the words either, mm -hmm. but if our inner feelings and our inner wisdom or understanding, whatever you might call us, is so immense, so great, why is it so hard to uh, uh, attract mostly the, the outer thing. Why can't that other thing be stronger so that the outer uh, world would not be uh, so obvious? Mainly because we have we have not grown as fast as we could have done in past lives, mainly for the reason that by mistakes committed we have uh, built around ourselves very heavy sheaths of consciousness and substance which prevent the inner energies from manifesting themselves as they could under other circumstances. It is because we have created for ourselves by a lot of mistakes, a lot of material attractions, uh, channels which were clogged, mostly with emotions, and uh, hide from active participation the inner energies of our spiritual self. We have placed ourselves with limitations. Nobody else has. It is a temporary condition, of course. You step out of it in a way in the world of sleep, but only temporarily. You step out of it in a much greater degree after you die, but only temporarily. You have to win that battle here, an incarnated waking existence. You have to um, thin out, purify, raise, transform to such an extent the lower sheaths of consciousness and substance that they, be that they become transparent uh, to the inner light, that they become unclogged purified enough to transmit the light and the power and the guidance and the influence of the inner self, then the things of matter of the outer world of emotions cease to have any attraction, cease to be of much importance except as means to some noble and lofty end. And that takes many lives to accomplish. That is because we have sunken into matter much more heavily than was supposed to be the case. We might say fallen angels again, yes, if you like. 
we have tripped and fallen pretty badly. But a lot of people, a lot of other people have done so with us. And that is applicable even to some of the great men, spiritually great, who may uh, be temporarily in our, in our world. They too may have made some mistakes in their own higher spheres, otherwise they wouldn't be here. Does that answer your question more or less? Now friends, I think it's just about time for us to close. We seem to have branched out today into all sorts of things. But um, in going back for just a brief moment to where we started from, let us bear in mind that um, a study of some of the main passages in the secret doctrine is not only a study of the words which the passage is made of. There are a great many ideas there between the lines. There are a great many ideas contained in separate passages which when put together give rise to a third new idea which was not obvious until you put these two or three passages together. That shows that there is in that work and in these writings much more than the mere words will imply. There are a great many things you can say, are not in the secret doctrine. Well, yes, they are not there in individual passages. Decidedly not there. But if you were to bring a few passages together and ponder over the various ways in which certain ideas are set and compare, you would suddenly find that after all, there is in the secret doctrine this, that, and the other point. If you have the right key to the unlocking of the inner and certain passages, that in itself is a life study. And I suppose that a great many students in the century to come will be uncovering depth in the secret doctrine, and Isis unveil too, which we have not even suspected were there. And the beauty of the study of these things is the fact of their elevating influence upon the student. However abstruse, abstract and metaphysical these teachings may be, they have a redeeming power. You fill your mind with these lofty thoughts and your mind begins after a while to soar over the petty things in life. You dwell on these teachings inwardly and you soon realize that the vibratory rate of your own mind has been raised so that many of your fears <coughs> and anxieties and shortcomings and peculiarities of the personal self have um, uh, become less prominent have loosened their hold upon your consciousness. That in itself is a marvelous effect. Anything that can do that, whether it be a printed teaching or the contemplation of a sunset, anything that can achieve that end is of a spiritual nature. Essentially, it is the urge on our part to identify ourselves with a greater consciousness within us, either by contemplation or concentration 
or even intellectual study if it is not a mere dry intellectual brain activity. <coughs> Any of these disciplines or methods of training are in, intended to raise the human consciousness from the personal to the impersonal, fairly well known to the relatively unknown, from the relatively dark to the relatively light and spiritual, so that by the study of these things we open doors of consciousness and we open them upon great wide fields, fields of thought which raise the human mind into the contemplation of spiritual realities. It is like opening a window and getting in the spring air into the room. It is like opening a door, a portal, and walking into a wide, great, rolling field with flowers in bloom. 